I've decided to talk about a project at a place called Littlecoat, and the reason for that is because it doesn't just involve conservation, which in the case of Mosaic is normally a very conservative act with a small c and very little restoration, only missing stones or small lacunae or holes will be filled, and then only if you know that, uh, what, what the design was. But in a particular case here, a unique example really, little coat, we had earlier evidence of what was there. And so there's a possibility of restoration. And the restoration is to such an extent modern mosaic. And I think that has something to do with the title of the talks today. Um, so little coat is situated in the northeast corner of Wiltshire, just near Hungerford, which was actually in Berkshire, but just over the border, in the centre of southern England. The house there, which is the centre of an estate, um, has amongst its possessions, or had then, this tapestry in Petit Point of a Roman mosaic that had been discovered. So this begins our story, and we are involved with time travel. We're going back to three locations, the late 1970s, the late 1720s, and the early 360s. Uh, this was actually made when the mosaic was discovered in 1728, and there was also an engraving made, which we'll come on to later. So it was known that this mosaic existed, but nobody knew quite, knew quite where it was or anything like that. An archaeologist called Bryn Walters and his team, Bernard Phillips and Luigi Thompson, and later Peter Johnson, were interested in Roman mosaics and trying to trace where they were and managed to identify the rough area where it was, and it so happens that their first trench landed on this. And uh, so it's a sort of time team thing now. Uh, up in the corner there, in that section, you see a cloak of an individual, and that is Orpheus. And for the second time today, we have Persephone with a goat behind her. I don't know how well you can see this, but there are tree roots all over, growing through it and everything. So this is the central section of that panel in which the tapestry was made. And as you can see, it has quite seriously deteriorated in parts. Again, so we, whoops, sorry, pressing the wrong button. That is Orpheus, now uncovered, and Persephone, more uncovered. Here, a figure of Venus on a hind, in front of a hind, more accurately. And down the far end of what we normally call the lower hall, uh, parts of that survived. And here we can see a sea panther, and on the left, there, holding a cantharus, or a crater of wine. And off to the right here, a dolphin escaping. The whole mosaic is recorded on the grid, it's drawn and photographed. And this photogra these photographs are very important to the conservation and restoration. There's the head of Orpheus. So this would have been made around 361. Underneath the floor, they found what's called a terminus post quem, which basically means it must have been made after it. It was a coin of uh, uh, the Emperor Julian, also known as Apostate. And during that short period, although Christianity was becoming more dominant, there was a pagan revival under Julian. And this floor is a pagan floor. So there, I don't know how well you can see that. Oops. The, down here, there's a division. And on this side, there is a first century Roman invasion road. 
which formed quite a sound base. And of course, on the sides of roads, the Romans would always build a ditch. And it's in the ditch that the mosaic surprisingly survives. Um, obviously, when it was uncovered in 1728, it must have been pretty much complete. But we do know that it wasn't absolutely complete. And so here you see it under grip being drawn and so on. From that drawing and from the photographs, a painting is made in gouache on our paper, and this forms the archaeological record, and it's a standard way of recording Roman mosaic. This painting was done by Luigi Thompson. And there's a section of it. I don't know how well you can see it, but the individual ranges of colour in each stone are actually recorded. It's a very accurate record. So, we've arrived in earnest. We're ready to lift the mosaic. There is the scrim. Probably can't make out the mosaic system, And the consolidation has just been completed. And plasticine was put at this time to hold the edges of the mosaic and stop them tumbling away. So, this, so to speak, is our mission statement, the method. I can't read that, but uh, I'll leave you to read it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, broadly speaking, the lift is nearly always a very similar mechanism, so that's why that's more detailed. And everybody imagines that's a difficult part, which by and large it's the easy part. Although it is important to have proper registration grids, so you can put it back in the same place. And also, you can control distortion as you relay it, because these things are in fragments very often. And the relaying, I don't really say much about what it'll be relayed into, because it might be for display in a museum, it might be for display on site, or just storage, we don't know. And so many different methods will be used for the relay. Here it was going to be relayed on site, and every expectation was it was going to be left without a cover at the time. So the decision was made to relay it in sand and cement because that was a cure at will. Uh, if you use in conservation cement, quite often it's bad, but if you do it in the right way, it's nowhere near so bad. It can cause the stones to crack up. But it's all to do with having water content as you use it. So you can see here, whoops, I've done this again, at the end. That area has already been scrimmed up, ready for lifting. So this, this scrim, which has a hexagonal weave, and it's cotton, is glued to the surface. Now you can see it at the bottom. So this may be interesting to some. This is the back of the mosaic. This is actually the back of the part which I showed you earlier, which is the sea panther that was holding the cantharus. And you can just make out the sort of black border line. The materials that they used were stone. So the white, which you can see here, is limestone. The blue is a blue lias. The browns and purples are sandstones. And the reds are terracotta. So they cut up tiles sometimes, or they just made special accessory type sizes and sticks, we think. Uh, one reason why this piece is quite interesting is because you can see different styles which indicate how they might have made it. In this section, you can see the tesserae are very tight. And in fact, even some of them are bigger at the base than they are on the surface. Um, and this implies very close work indeed, normally only possible if you were doing it in an indirect way. And this is all very contentious. And uh, like many of these things, one can have so many different opinions. We'd soon finish up in Syria. But um, I wanted to make that point. And then you can see also some of these are. Whereas if you look here, you can see the tesserae are smaller at the base, which is what we're looking at now, because it's upside down. And that, to me, implies that that was probably laid direct method 
to fill in after the panel was laid. So it's probably made in part and then adjusted on site according to how everything fitted together. But that's my opinion. Also, quite interestingly, I noticed playing around with the Photoshop that some Sinopa, or Sinopia, is present on these blue. Can you see some lines there? And this is it's just a posh word for red ochre. Uh, it used to come from a town called Sinopa, off the Black Sea, Turkey. And you can maybe be able to see two lines on those blues. And these are from Roman times. And they're actually applied directly to the back of the tessera. So again, it gives us some idea of what might have been going on. But usually it just deepens the confusion. <laughs> so because we have, which we still haven't seen, the engraving and the embroidery, it was decided, and the owner, a very enlightened person called Sir Seton Wills, uh, decided to fund the archaeology. He wanted it done properly. He would funded it himself, and it all was done down to natural and recorded. In addition, he also was keen to restore the mosaic because these records existed from the 1720s. And there were two of them, and we could use them to compare. We were all pretty reluctant because obviously we don't want to be accused of making a fake or anything like that. So initially we decided that there was a lot of spare tesserae which had become disassociated uh, because they're pieces of stone, they don't really deteriorate, they just lose their place. And we were going to use those to make good the geometric sections in the lower hall. And in addition, we had enough of the remains of the Sea Panther panel, which we were looking at, to make the symmetrical copy of that. So the first phase was to do that. So in 1978, the mosaic was discovered. We lifted it, rediscovered, I should say. And then over the winter, we made up some panels amongst our other works. So the panels we're talking about are here. These four, that bit there, and all the geometrics around, where it's clear that the design, you know, we have enough to know the design. Uh, the rest of it was left, although we did fill in the smaller lacunae and so on in this section and around these figures here, although in Venus it was made up a bit more. Um, so that was the first phase, really, of the restoration. And as I said, it's an unusual thing to do. This is the engraving by George Virtue. And over time, we discovered, I discovered, really, that by taking closer slides of it um, and superimposing them over tracings of the floor, they were incredibly accurate. And during the dig, nails were discovered, which date from that period. And he clearly drew it under grid, and it was so accurate that even the andamenti, the lines of stones, lined up directly on this tracing, which gave an enormous amount of uh, confidence to us about maybe we could go ahead with the restoration. Uh, the only problem was, which is unfortunate, but by Orpheus, and I maybe should have pointed that out, he's missing a companion here. Normally, Orpheus is sat, displayed quite often in Roman mosaic in this period, in 4th century Britain, and surrounded, he, you know, he charms the animals and the birds, and firstly, he'll be surrounded by fowl or birds going round, and also then after that, a procession of beasts. This is a very common thing, but here, not so much, although there are beasts, obviously, in the quadrants around, behind the female figures. So... Uh, that, that was quite a surprise, but actually by Orpheus, the dog was missing, and he normally has a dog or a fox, uh, red in colour, so that's why it's thought to be a fox. And maybe with a bushy tail, maybe not, sometimes a bushy tail. So now we are relaying, and uh, there's Gino, who I was working with, you can see there. Um, here you can see some pieces, maybe, on cardboard, ready for laying, another piece there, 
and these are in reverse so they've been made up to fill this section. The original has been relayed, these lacunae have been left to fill in afterwards mostly by direct method, although it's not significant in the floor because you have to have a flat fall. Uh, over here is definitive proof that uh, people were still wearing flared trousers in <laughs> 1979. <laughs> Although archaeologists are always behind the times. <laughs> so there's another picture. As Gino is joined by some scruffy chat there. And we're removing the paper and revealing the mosaic underneath. There's Gino and George, another chap I worked with. And here they're doing quite a large direct uh, reconstruction here of the Cantharis. And on the same day, also, the reconstruction of the rest of the dolphin here was actually done in reverse, so it would fit in easily and give us more speed and getting it down in the day. You know, the mortar is setting. So we could put all that down and then we filled in around there to finish it off. There you see the, the, the last bits of that being knocked in by George. And you can see a wooden block, which is what we'd use, with rounded edges so it won't catch on the lips. And it's literally beaten in and then Rob then finally to get rid of all the air pockets and everything underneath to make a solid floor. Here is Gino, looking delighted to be photographed, <laughs> or perhaps looking forward to the prospect of having to mix up the colour, which is always quite unpleasant, because you get cement everywhere, up your nose and everything. But we did colour the grout, and you can see here some of the colouring on top, underneath a mixture of white and grey cements. This is to imitate the colour of Roman mortar, which uh, has a high brick dust content uh, for reasons of a hydraulic set to help it dry out. And we are trying to match that in, because not only will it then match the original, but it's also more sympathetic to have this kind of colour grout in most mosaic, in fact. Then we come to Laorpheus. You can see here, or I hope you can see, a line stretched out, and then maybe you can see the grid lines drawn on the mosaic. Here it's still got the scrim on, so that we can get the alignment of Orpheus precisely right. And over here we'll have all our grid lines marked on the timber there, so that, you know, it's very important to get the correct orientation. We have to start in the centre here, because the mosaic is distorted, it's been sheared by going into the ditch, and we need to contain this again. These grid lines should really be on all mosaic because then you can see whether you're creeping or shrinking as you're going along. Usually you expand and uh, it's always worth doing. The poor chap on site then knows what's happening. So that's as the scrim is removed and uh, you can see more clearly green line there, and the red line there, of our grid lines. The mosaic is backed up, as it always should be, back grouted. The grout goes into the holes, which helps actually stabilise them as you remove the scrim. And then you remove the grout and fill in the holes afterwards as you go along. And the process continues. Gino is laying a section of border, and we've left here the head that's present at the center of this, if you like, a sunburst, or maybe these, you know, some people say it's a reflection of folds and tents, but I do think that it's a sunburst. And here, in both sources, there is shown to be a head, and also there is enough remains of this head to know that it was there. So, 1979, um, this was the position. We'd restored the panels that were largely present with Roman testerae. There's a little bit there 
as an experiment that was done adding in the dog. Part of the dog did remain, so we definitely know there was a dog. The reason why we think it didn't appear on the engraving is because the floor was probably cracked at the, in antique, well, in 1720s, because the, this right-hand part, the part that survived, had fallen into the ditch and was at a different level. So the, the dog had probably had already been lost a bit and virtue didn't notice it. And that's the bottom panel of the lower hall. So that's basically how it looks after a thunderstorm, which brings out the colours nicely, because they all look darker when uh, the colours come out, you know, when they're wet. So now it's decided to go ahead with a secondary phase of restoration. And uh, basically the idea was to complete it, according to the engraving as the primary source. Again, I hope you can read that, because it's more than I can do. Um, and the important point about this is that all the parts that we are doing now are going to be made in a, well, carried out in a material of earthenware strips that were extruded and coloured in, in the body and then cut up so that there'd be an obvious difference between what was Roman and what we were putting in as restoration. Otherwise, everybody would say it was a fake, you know, which uh, obviously we don't want. Um, so we're back to the engraving again. So we're restoring that panel, that panel, all of this, all of that. And also these two panels here. So in order to do this, um, I made some drawings on drafting film because it's dimensionally stable. You can go out to site and check it. If it gets wet, it doesn't matter. And obviously you can see through both sides of it, which is very useful when you're working in reverse. Uh, here I made a sort of photo montage, black and white, of the parts that remained in this apse. Uh, the photographs are actually done in reverse because we developed them ourselves so that they would appear in reverse like that. It's more convenient for me because I'm having to work in reverse. And you're looking at the back here of those parts of the Roman mosaic. That was still, the, main, the mosaic was still intact and that we lifted. And I don't know if you can see the drawings. You might, be able to, you might be able to see the grid lines that are also drawn on there. I hope you can. So there's Brim Walters, who was the archaeological director on the left. And that's me on the right, believe it or not. Um, I did say time travel was involved. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope, well, here you can see, maybe you can't, but every line on this reconstruction drawing, every line is drawn so the design can be agreed as we go along. And we took this policy of involving others, particular, particularly Dr. David Smith, whose pupil Peter Johnson was, and there others, yes, and uh, he sort of oversaw, in large part, stylistically, our reconstruction. And there's Bruno and I again. Uh, you might be able to see some of the strips of terracotta, extruded terracotta, with the various colours in lying around there, which we cut up to make the mosaic. All the panels are now being made up. Uh, we took them to the country house where they happen to have a very convenient barn for us to use. And we laid it all out in reverse. And what we're actually doing here is trying to match the mixtures of colours in the white. We had to make about uh, six different shades of white in order to imitate the limestone because of the variation in colour you get, the iron stains and the... It also actually is worthwhile because it makes it look better and started off some of my interest in mixing colours for modern mosaic. And uh, George has just taken out a few, I don't know if you can see, to change the colour to get the balance more even between all of the panels. Another feature, this is a reconstruction of, uh, this is a missing head, not the one we saw earlier, but it's the same sort of design. 
This is seen to be the head of a panther, uh, which was a beast that's sort of sacred or representative of Dionysus. The Roman equivalent is Bacchus. But this is very Greek floor, of Greek influence, to do with Greek mythology and Greek mysteries. And so Dionysus is really the better description here. One of the interesting technical things here is that all Roman mosaic, not only is it hand cut individually, made out of stone and so on, and quite often cut on four sides even, it also is beveled on the surface around all the sides so you won't get a lip to catch yourself on. And it also improves the way the andamento works with the, uh, the grout lines. It's a fantastic thing that so much work goes into it. When we're doing it here, we haven't bothered to bevel them all, particularly, but we did find we have, in order to give a similar appearance to the Roman, we had to leave quite wide joints. So, although you saw the back of the Roman mosaic earlier was very tight, here you see we've got it all rather open. And the reason is to match the effect of that beveling. Another feature of the beveling, of course, is the Roman mortar would then come round the top and overhang slightly, so holding the stones down more efficiently. And there's a sea panther made up. Uh, sorry, not panther made up. This uh, is opposite the sea panther, so the other side of the lower hall. And there's a series identified by holding a shaft of wheat. And uh, she is the goddess of agriculture. And there you see most of the made-up sections in this hall. Uh, apologies, my efforts at Photoshop it was very dark. <laughs> so now we're starting to relay them, lay them rather, because they never lifted. And here you see the, the panthers, which we saw earlier. This is very interesting, a very interesting and unusual panel, almost certainly representing water, we feel and it gives a division between the two halves of the mosaic, because almost certainly this is a room for religious reasons. This may be then dividing line you pass when you're purified and ready to partake in the rituals. Here you see Ceres going down. Just see the paper at the moment. The keener eye might be able to spot grid lines. You might also see the, all the drawing as well of uh, the bull. Uh, the method of doing this, I would draw it on drafting film and I made a template with drafting film of the existing. And then to transfer it to paper, first I put carbon paper down in rolls, it's very convenient. Early days of computing, you used to get these sort of great reels of carbon paper to make copies from one page to the other. And I used to go and binge all that from the wages. And uh, so you lay carbon paper down with the black face up, the carbon side up, then the paper, then carbon paper again, face side down, and the black side down, and then the drafting film, and then we'd pin all that down securely, take out, you know, obviously as we go, any bumps, and then we transfer the whole image to both sides of the paper, including the grid lines, using barrows. Uh, the barrow can press quite hard, and a little ball just helps you move it along a bit. Uh, quite a few lost their ends and had to get another one. And uh, you can also see where you've been because then you don't go over a line twice or did I do that one or did I not? Uh, and there you see the paper being removed anyway, coming back to the relay. You see George there. And um, the ball is appearing. So one day, well, late in the evening, actually, and you can see the trees are casting their shadow over the mosaic. It's completed. Phew. <laughs> then it just needed cleaning. Um, apologies for the pink shirt and the kefaya, but it was a very hot day. I don't suppose it excuses the pink. So, I think we have some pictures here which give you sort of before and after. But I will point out there, can you see Orpheus's dog? The remains of it. So after 
frustration, and then on discovery in 17, oh, sorry, 1978. And then uh, this is Persephone. Unfortunately, some of the faces of the, uh, or most of the faces actually, seem to have been lost or almost deliberately damaged. And in, 17, in the 1720s, you know, the religious conflicts were still very vibrant in England. And I won't be surprised if local parson came and smashed them as idolatrous images or something like that. It does seem to be the case. But Orpheus somehow escaped that. But maybe they knew that, uh, you know, he wasn't uh, supposed to be pretending to be a god. So there's Persephone restored. And on we go. So to give you some idea, this is a sort of orthometric uh, view. You can see the mosaic peeping through the roof of what the building would have looked like. And this is another view, sort of an you know, artist's impression. And here, this is where the mosaic is on, in that building there. Here, there's a little section containing a small bars and um, an oven, possibly for preparing sacrificial meats or parts of necessaries for the, the ceremonies inside. There is an area here which you could describe as a timonus, a sort of sacred enclosure where people could meet to before and after services to reflect, because it's all enclosed in privacy. This is a map of the site. There's the mosaic. That's the bars, and the oven, for my hands too shaky to delineate them too well, that's the Timonos. Here, the first century road used to come through here. And it's interesting actually that in the 1720s, they said they discovered a coin of Vespasian. Although Vespasian wasn't emperor when he conquered southern Britain. Um, he was a general. But there's an interesting comparison. He may have even walked down that road or been driven down it. And um, this is a Mancio serving that road, it's thought. Here, a second century wing corridor building. So this will be like 200 years before this was built. And there's a massive gatehouse and another building here serving, I, as far as I know, it's an unknown function, but I may well be wrong. Um, so to talk about this floor, as I've been hinting as we go along, it is a religious floor. And most Roman mosaics you know, have a lot of mythology involved with them. They depict mythological scenes. In this particular case, it's a very important part of the floor. And the interpretation of it is potentially very complicated. Uh, some people take a more simplistic view but I think given the amount of work and effort and the complexity of the design, I think a complex interpretation of the mythologies and the reasonings behind it is essential. In the, this is in the lower hall then, if you remember. So this is at the extreme bottom of the mosaic, if you like. The dolphins here represent the forces of chaos in Roman uh, art a lot. They're being driven away. And in the center here is a crater or cantharis of wine being supported by two sea panthers. You could think of them as seals if you like. And you notice the difficult, difficulty of keeping this thing upright with such a tiny stand. Of course, you just had to make sure you drank the contents, I suppose. Uh, so you come in to this building, there's the doorway entrance coming over there. So to your left, you see the forces of chaos being driven away. The animals, the sea panthers are animals that can come out onto land. So you get the feeling the sea is chaos, the land is more secure. And so they're not so bad, they can stay. Then I'm sorry, uh, you know, over photoshopped image here, but it's really just to show the position of things. These geometric panels surrounded by guilloche, a sort of rope design, 
and then also by Meander, or Greek key design, sometimes called swastika. These are all designed to be sort of good spells to keep away evil spirits and so on to protection. Uh, it's often said, even by visitors, how common this is to many Masonic floors. Um, the flower in the center is probably an open lotus. At this end, then, we have land panthers supporting Acantharus because, of course, they're facing the opposite direction. And when we come on to the next piece, you'll see that Orpheus is also facing the, uh, the central apse of this design. And um, clearly the celebrant, the, the priest or whatever, will be standing in that section. And then this section here is water, as I mentioned before. So you sort of come in here, you maybe have some rites, maybe you drink some wine or something, and get yourself in the right frame of mind to enter the sort of holier section here. There's Orpheus then, with his dog. Now the Orphic cult, which is what is uh, almost certainly behind all of this, is one of many Gnostic cults, which literally means, you know, people who know in Greek. And Orphism was one, as the cult of Isis, Mithras, and so on, many of these. And in Roman terms, they would have seen Christianity as yet another, because, you know, although Christianity was becoming preeminent at this point, it wasn't fully established, and certainly not under Julian, because uh, he tried to take it all back. Well, it's possibly a little unfair, but that's pretty much it. So, here we're back to Persephone again. Sorry to share the same slide, but it's really to explain the interpretation. She is waving to a figure on her left, which is Ceres, and Ceres is her mother. And we alluded earlier to the mythology behind that, uh, Fabrizio, and the story is that Persephone was abducted by Pluto and taken to the underworld and the situation got very bad. Ceres was extremely upset. So all the crops failed. No sacrifices for the gods. That can't do. So the gods got together and decided there must be a solution. And an agreement was reached whereby she spends six months of the year with Ceres and six months of the year with Pluto. And this is the explanation behind the seasons. So when she emerges, we get spring and summer. When she returns, we get autumn and winter. It gives an idea of these four panels as being the four seasons of the year, uh, although there are many different ways of going through these four images. And that happens to be one. Behind is a goat, which is also the image of Pluto. And it's interesting that it should be there. These are the second two figures, there's Venus. Her belly is actually redone. It doesn't look like that, ultimately. I've just selected this slide because it shows them both. This is the figure of Venus, here representing an adolescent beauty, uh, but undoubtedly, uh, you know, virginal, she's still a child. And behind a hind. Here we have Leda and the swan, and in the back, a panther, the panther is symbolic of Dionysus, and the swan, I don't know if we know, you know this one, but uh, Zeus turns himself into a swan and seduces Leda, and clearly this is the moment when the girl becomes a woman and is involved with the production of children. And interestingly also, she's waving, and perhaps she's waving back to her innocent self as Venus. Um, the children produced by this union, quite famous, uh, the Dioscuroi, or the heavenly twins, Castor and Pollux. You can still see them when you go out and look at the stars at night. And uh, Helen, also of Troy. And uh, then, so, as I mentioned, Ceres, Again, this is another terrible picture because it's been over-photoshopped. Sorry about that. 
So we're going around in circles. I also think that the characteristics of the animals, although there's a very complex thing about Dionysus fleeing from the Titans when he transforms himself into these four animals. I won't go into that because there's limited time. Um, but I think that the, they also give away the animals something of the male characteristics through the same period. The goat is like a little boy. The hind is like the koros, you know, like the beautiful young man of uh, the epitome of beauty in Greece. The panther, the stronger man, the virile young man, and the bull, the more mature, like Ceres, you know, the mother, the established mother, rather than the point of being a mother. So we have all these circles of going on of the seasons, the ages of man, and so on, all tied up with mythology. It is very complicated. At the, another point here, the panther that's at the centre of these rays, say from the sun, these might be clouds. Uh, this panther illustrates one of the three gods um, that are involved with the Orphic religion. And like many religions, you know, you have this idea of three gods in one. Like the Vedic religion, you'll get sort of Brahma, <coughs> Shiva and Vishnu. And in Christianity, you'll get God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all being like three gods of one. And also, in the Orphic religion, you have Apollo, Dionysus, and Orpheus. But I suppose roughly, this is not a direct comparison, but roughly Orpheus is like Christ. He's on earth, a real person. He descends to the underworld. We know the myth of Eurydice, but we can't go on, or Eurydice, really. And the interesting thing is, of course, Apollo is a sun god. But in this section, the panther is um, the representation of Dionysus, as I've been saying. So he is showing, as a sun god, a kind of merging of gods called syncretism. And that is, makes that an interesting section. We're surrounded by these lotuses, and they're also in the lower hall. There's a couple of busts here that are found. The one on the right is of Antinous and there's a favourite of Hadrian's, and you can see he's actually emerging out of a lotus, a uh, lotus being very common in Egypt. He was drowned in the Nile, either with or without assistance. Uh, people were somewhat jealous of him. And there's another view there of the panther. This is the original one which most survived. And there you can see the rays emanating out. This is from Luigi's drawing. The painting, rather. So there's a sort of view of it all. And um, I think that's it. Is it? Yes. Um, I, I was just going to add a few sort of little statistics um, and a comment. But one is, that uh, it says it was about 10 man years work, this. And it does comprise upwards of three quarters of a million hand cut stones, which is uh, quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think another important point to make about this is how the mosaic is tied in with the celebrations that would have taken place there, part of the rituals, you can see how much this is involved with its surroundings and the use of the building as a cult center. The shape of the building is also very interesting. The triapsidal or triconchal shape is not really seen much in the Roman world until the beginning of the sixth century when it becomes a standard form for churches <coughs> in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the cruciform design. And it's also interesting to see that they're sophisticated enough, all of these are flint balls, to build the apses the sort of proper way, which is to use five sides of an octagon on the exterior. So, that is it now. <laughs> Thank you. Um,